in this area somewhere in 1871. And she was only six years old when uh, General Howard made a move from here, chased them all away. Uh, she was only six, six years old, 1877. So uh, when I was before my grandmother, I, I knew her because she was, she was still a little girl, and she had to move from here. So she got back over there where, where I was born, and she married. Married my grandfather, so and uh, uh, they had uh, two daughters and a uh, uh, son. But, uh, uh, most of them, well, my mother was stayed alive, but while I was in the service, she passed away. Well, and all we kept uh, doing was those of us. My grandmother used to talk to me about the wolf and uh, <coughs> told me how important they were to our people when. They lived out in the villages, different villages like camping out for huckleberry picking or gathering things up for fishing and fish. And, uh, and they'd be sitting around the campfire at night, and then all of a sudden they hear a wolf howl. They hear a wolf howl. So they'd listen. And then uh, the man would. would uh, get pretty much direction that where the wolf sound was coming from. They would go over there in the morning early and we'd see a buck deer standing there waiting for it. That's the way it works. That was a true story that the grandmother told me. That happened quite a few times. And that's, uh, that's how uh, important the wolf was to us. And uh, I've never, never that I heard of any time that uh, our people have killed a wolf or with a hide or anything. Yeah, he never did. He never did do that. And, uh, I was always a, a close connection with the wolf and the, my people. Right. That way. There's other things that uh, the wolf, wolf would do also. To, to uh, warn, warn, the, warn the tribe, warn the people for something else that's going to try to come there like a cougar maybe. But, uh, then if that was going to happen, they'd come real close and, and do, the, do the howling. So that's it's a warning. But, uh, we were pretty, pretty closely connected to the wolf. And uh, never did, never did uh, could butcher a wolf or the, or the pelt or anything. And uh, never did bother them because they were they, they pretty close with uh, our people. And that, that's the story that I used to hear about the wolf. And so as I grew up, I, I had respect for the wolf. And, uh, and then when, uh, when the wolf got brought back and uh, back to Idaho, Ma, and I, I went. I went to Montana to, to greet them, and then they, they went down and uh, tried to turn them loose, and then uh, so many people objected, objected to the wolf being blue, turned loose in Idaho, that they, they, they chased them away. So that wasn't right to me, but then what could I say? But that's what happened. And, uh, they didn't want the wolf back, because... Uh, because they were all gone, but there's uh, still the uh, stories that they heard about them killing the stock and all that. But that's what made them turn against the wolf. They're still like that in Idaho. And, and I don't know. It's still, it's still going on, so I, there's nothing much I can do about it. So all I can do is just talk to my own people and still show respect for the wolf, like the people who did a long time ago. The connection still stands with, with my feeling. Uh, if I heard a wolf out in the hour, I'd, I'd go investigate. And, uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of him, like <laughs> some people are. Because uh, <clears throat> this man from southern Idaho brought uh, seven wolves up to our, our land and, and, uh, and 
that way. And uh, he wanted a place to put them, rent them off a place for them to roam. You know, so they could have wolves like they close by. So I tried, we got, made a big, big yard, big tent place, and had the wolves up there. But I haven't been back up there to see if they're still up there lately. I used to go up there and visit them and, and go right into the pen where they are. And they come and put the pot on my hair and lick my face. And that's the way they greet you. And I found that out. I'm going straight on I put the big paws right here and lick my face. He'd go to the next one and call me there. I fell off and all eight of them would do that. And I had a clean face the next time I got through. And, uh, and I wasn't afraid of them either, so I guess we could, we could tell that from, from them, I could tell right away that they stand there and look at me like that for quite a while, lined up. And then, then the, the big one, the first leader would come over first, and after that they'd take the train. He'd, he'd leave, walk away, and another one come, and do the same thing, so they was all gone. I never, never got bit or anything, so never, never. Uh, that was my connection to the wolf. Uh, I still feel that way about the wolf. I, I'm not, uh, not afraid of them like the uh, poem say they got to be shot right on, on sight, you know. And the sooner, the sooner I have a real eye connection with them before, you know, usually they look at you and they think you're all right, they just walk away. They are. That's the way I, I understand the wolf that way. And so I never, I've never been seen one shot yet, but I, I would probably object to that if I had seen it myself. So uh, that's the way they used to. That wolf would howl, howl at them at night, and then. In the morning, the, one of the one of the elder men, one of the men would go out there and, and look, see where the kind of go towards the direction that wolf was howling, and he'd go over there and, and see an elk standing there looking around like that. That's where he killed him, or elk, or a coyote, uh, uh, a deer. Sometimes it'd be a deer, but that's the way they they're connected with it. And that's why they they never did kill the wolf for, to make the skins out of, you know, out of use the furs or anything. I never did see it. In, in my tribe, never seen a, a, a wolf skin on the floor. You know, they had that good feeling with them all the time. And they protected them. So that's the way they, they got along. And over here too, I guess that happened over here. That connection went clear over there after they had to move over there. Hmm. <clears throat> so that's the story. I don't know if I ever told you that, but that's, that's, that's one, one of my best stories that I have about the wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so this man from Idaho, he brought, uh, my southern Idaho, he brought his eight wolves up there. And uh, so I went up there with my fingers going to greet the wolves at night. So I got my bell out and I, I started singing. And when I started singing, all the wolves started howling. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. They howled as long as I was singing. It must be so much better than I, that I really took up for them every time. Every time. But now I, I haven't been able to ride up there like I used to. So I don't know whether we got any left up there. Mm -hmm. They had a big compound fenced off for them to stay. But they were they were tamed already. But still, uh, you know, some people were still afraid of them. So, uh, I, I want to go up there and see if they still got any up there yet. I haven't been up there for about two years now. Uh, and my legs are like they used to be, and I don't walk as much. I stay pretty close to the house. Uh, I don't go out and fish like I used to either, so. Mm. <laughs> I keep my 
walking anymore. I think that's true for a lot of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the coyote stories are <laughs> so much uh, uh, made up stories. Here. Yeah. There's quite a few made up stories about, about the coyote. And, uh, and how uh, they, they got along and all that. One story I was told by one of my, my elders about two coyotes they living together and so one morning they were eating breakfast and, and the one of them, the older one called the other one and told him you know, you've done something wrong and he said you, you dumb coyote you've done something that you're not supposed to do and he looked at him and said well I'm not a coyote and then they argued they argued and argued and finally, finally they said well let's go out to the village where all the Indian people are camped, like a village here with all the teepees. We go out there and we'll walk out there and see what they say. All right. So we walked out there and the one, the older one, he said, okay, now I'm going to walk out there in the open. And he walked out in the open. All the people come out and said, oh, look at the coyote. Coyote, they could hear him, you know. Yeah. See, I told you, now you walk out here. He walked out there, and everybody looked up. Oh, there's another one. See, I told you I'm not a coyote. I'm another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I, was, I was told that story when I was just a little kid. Oh, yeah. I, I like you talking about your grandmother a hundred more than a hundred years ago. And remembering the, the wolf stories that they're telling you about. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, a lot of the old old guys that were warriors in that war that we had in the United States Army. Well, <clears throat> they used to come out and visit my grandmother because none of them could speak English. They still talk mm. our language. So <clears throat> I used to listen to them tell stories. Because I knew how, I knew what they were saying. I could understand the language. And my grandmother talked to me every day in my first because she couldn't speak English. So that's why I learned how to speak the language. And I still do. I still hold on to that. I try to pass my grand on to my grandchildren. <laughs> so it's kind of hard, you know, nowadays to try to put another language into somebody else, especially when. But in school, they, they teach them anyway, all the different syllables and everything else like that. But, but we can't do that in the next first language because it's all it's, it's unwritten. There's some people can write it, but I can write it, but it's, it's well, hard for anybody else to read. You know. it's, a, it's a language that I, I grew up with. So my grandmother just didn't speak English at all. So I, I heard her talk every day. So when I got in the service, and I used to walk guard by myself, so I, I used to talk to her. In fact, I was talking to her, then I'd answer for her. So I could keep my language. I never forgot my language. I was gone for three years. I never, I never missed a word. So I, kept, I kept my language going just by myself, but talking to my grandmother and answering to her. <laughs> That's the way I kept my language. I, to I told her that when I came home. I told her that she was still alive when I got home. <laughs> my, mother, my mother had passed away <clears throat> when I was gone. My grandmother was still alive. She, she talked to me and I talked right back to her in our language. Uh, Oh, she was happy about that. She told me she yeah, told me next week she could do it. I'd like to ask the solar if it's all cut in. You never forgot your neighbor at all over there, she said. <laughs> That's a bracket. I didn't bracket these notes. Bracket. <laughs>